underhanded things she did to survive, which seems like it surrounds a lot of the wealthier people who managed to make it out alive. I don't know if that's human imagination running wild or maybe there's something to it. I suppose you could speak to that more. What was her experience when the ship went down and what were some of the rumors of her survival? Not really clear on how those rumors started, but um, there was, for some reason, they were accused of not going back to pick up people that were in the water. Even though, Scott, there were many lifeboats in the water that could have been, um, you know, accused of the same thing. Uh, the people in the lifeboats could have been accused. I think what was different in this case was that, you know, they were trying to be kind and pay these men that were rowing them. And I think it got misinterpreted. Yeah, I could see the Titanic. If someone is looking at his story through a specific bent, maybe they're looking at it through class division. Then if they have a rumor about a wealthy person possibly doing something to secure their position, it could be easy for them to run wild with it. So it's interesting that things like these can be blown out of proportion, but also that there would be evidence that would emerge later that could vindicate them. Right. And it was really neat that it happened, but it's sad that it happened so far after um, they passed away. Well, for her as a fashion trendsetter, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about what she was wearing when the ship went down, because a lot of people imagine many people are just half dressed or barely dressed because they have to jump out of bed and throw on whatever they can, and maybe they can't grab their clothes. But that was not the case with Lady Duff Gordon. So what outfit did she have on as she was in the lifeboat? Well, good question. I'm glad you asked because it is interesting and we do know. And uh, I think it is important to note what L- Lady Duff Gordon was wearing when, um, you know, the Titanic was going down. She usually went to bed dressed in case anything should happen. Um, and that night was no different. She wore a pink Japanese padded gown and stockings. Her hair was up in red curls or curlers, and it was tied in a blue chiffon scarf. And those, Scott, were the clothes that the great fashion designer would be wearing when she arrived in New York City. Well, she really does have a rags of riches story and this self-made woman. Can you tell me a bit about the shops that she started, I think, in England that made her wealthy and made her this international tastemaker? Yes, she was incredible. And she even had a shop in Chicago, which is where I I live in the Chicago area, and she opened it in 1911. She had shops in Paris. She opened one in New York City in 1909. And it really is, as you say, an an inspiring rag to riches story. She had become practically penniless. Um, She had married at 18 and soon divorced. As I mentioned, she was a single mother. Um, She set up her very first dress shop in a rented space at number four, Old Burlington Street in London's stylish Mayfair neighborhood in 1894. And I think that's so neat that she, you know, had really little money and she used whatever she had to find a spot in one of the most fashionable areas. And she did whatever she had to do to afford to make that happen. Um, And that area, what's really neat about it, as we talk about style, it's right around the corner from the very well-heeled bespoke suit shops of the Seville Row where you can go and have a a suit tailored right to you. So many men have their measurements taken there and they they keep them for years and years and keep um, making uh, tailored suits for men. So it it was definitely um, at the forefront of fashion back then. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. These are two fashion designers and they're trendsetters in that way. Our third trendsetter, who could very well be the most recognizable name among the passenger manifesto of the Titanic, is John Jacob Astor. He's a hotelier. And if I understand correctly, in the early 20th century, in the Edwardian age, hotels are one of the most important places alongside private clubs where you could see and be seen. I'd be very interested to hear what was his experience on the Titanic. And maybe you could give also a little bit of background to those who don't know of John Jacob Astor. 
Right. You know, we hear so much about the Astors in modern times and what we don't realize, you know, I know, I think most people associate the name Astor with Titanic and that's because he for, by far was the wealthiest man aboard. He lived in New York City and had several hotels there. I'll tell you a little bit about those in a few minutes, but um, he was an incredible man um, and he also was you know, one of the best dressed men, of course, with um, you know, beautiful suits and all the styles of the day that he kept up with. But what's really key about him as a trendsetter are some of the things that we uh, take for granted today that he started. For instance, John Jacob Astor IV was the first person to introduce crowd management by using red velvet ropes at events. And he did that at one of his hotels in New York. At, at both of them, he opened... Um, the Knickerbocker, the um, St. Regis Hotel, and also, you know, he merged the Waldorf Astoria is a merger of two hotels, the Waldorf Hotel and the Astoria Hotel. He merged it with his cousin's hotel. Hmm. Um, when, one of the things he did, too, is something that, you know, these days every developer out there is looking for the location nearest to a subway station. Well, John Jacob Astor was way ahead of his time and already back in the early 1900s was plotting the spot to put hotels like the Knickerbocker, which is actually right in a subway station in New York City. You can still see the old door that led directly from the platform, the train platform where you can where you now stand and wait for trains, there's a door that's now sealed and it says Knickerbocker above the door in tiles. So it's um, a little reminder of what an incredible man this was. Well, in this podcast, we're focusing on drinking and dining on the Titanic and the culinary culture there. John Jacob Astor had a big influence on this. And what were some of the specific ways that he influenced this? Well, you know, there were three key things that I think of that I thought were really interesting. Um, the Bloody Mary, as we know it today, was said to be developed at the St. Regis Hotel. And also the perfect martini. Many people consider the perfect martini to be one that was invented at the Knickerbocker. Um, although there's so many stories out there that of people claiming, oh, it was invented here or there with both of those drinks. But um, really and truly, you know, the way those drinks have been modernized, are, that's where it really started, where the modernization of those drinks started um, happening. Another drink that um, was invented in Philadelphia, what, but became popular because of, of how it was um, made and how people drank it at one of John Jacob Astor the Fourth's hotels is the Clover Club. And uh, the Clover Club is made with um, raspberry simple syrup. It's it's like a martini with raspberry simple syrup. And um, the Clover Club was invented in Philadelphia. But as I was talking about, you know, it actually really made headlines first at the Waldorf Astoria Bar. One of the things that John Jacob Astor really helped spread as far as a, a trend is um, – honoring champagne traditions and customs. He would even dress up like Napoleon Bonaparte for his parties. And very often he would saber a bottle of champagne to saber a bottle of champagne is to take a sword and cut the top of the champagne bottle off with one swipe of the sword. And he would do this with gallantry and entertain his um, guests and, and his customers sometimes with those types of traditions. It was something that Napoleon Bonaparte used to do to honor those that fought in battle for him um, and those that lost their lives in battle to him. To this day, in almost every single St. Regis Hotel lobby in the world, at 6 p.m., you can walk into the lobby and they will be sabering a bottle of champagne just like that. Yeah, so there's a huge legacy here and what he did and his habits are still being experienced and people are still taking part of today. Uh, so what was his experience on the Titanic? John Jacob Astor IV sadly did not survive. His wife, he had a, a new wife. They had just been married that September before the Titanic. They had been on their 
long extended honeymoon. And, uh, you know, he was last seen on the deck of the Titanic. Um, it, it was one of the most tragic uh, aspects of this incredible ship because he was such a, an amazing trendsetter and a businessman. You know, this man invented the street cleaner as we know it today. He had a patent for it. And uh, people don't even really, I don't think the vast majority of people are aware of that. So the world as we know it today, it, you know, it just makes you wonder had he survived, he was only in his 40s, had John Jacob Astor IV survived, what else would we have? How would his life have gone on and gone forward? And how might it have affected how we live today? We have a lot of different recipes to choose from, but something we do at this podcast to wrap things up is to do a recipe spotlight of either food or drink that somehow evokes a spirit of the different type of person we looked at. And we looked at a few of these, but we're going to drill down into more detail here. So Veronica, can you tell us what is a recipe spotlight? How do you make it? And how did you choose this particular one? Well, I chose the Clover Club for the cocktail in honor of Lucille Carter um, and the, Car- the, the whole Carter family. Um, the Clover Club was the obvious pick because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was invented in Philadelphia where the Carters live. The Clover Club was invented in the Carters' town where they lived in Philadelphia. Uh, and it was popularized, even though it had been invented there. It was made more popular at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, John Jacob IV's hotel. So, um, and of course, his cousin's hotel too with the merger. But those that one recipe really ties those two trendsetters together for this episode. Now, the Clover Club is the perfect drink for... Valentine's Day, Sweetest Day. That's because it's bright pink. It's made with raspberry syrup, and you can make your own simple syrup with raspberries and sugar and boiled water. You boil it all together. That recipe is not in the the recipe in the book, but it's a basic simple syrup recipe. Um, It's also made with a little bit of gin some lemon juice and some egg whites. And you just shake everything together in a, in a cocktail shaker with ice, you strain it through and it's the egg white gives it a nice little foaminess and the raspberry syrup gives it a beautiful, brilliant pink color. All right. Definitely fit for trendsetters and fashionistas everywhere. The early 20th century. Kind of a girly drink. And ironically, (laughs) there's, there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of history here too with the Clover Club because it was invented at the Bellevue Hotel which was the the hotel back in 1976 where legionnaire's disease was uh, where where it broke out during the convention of the American Legion um and that's why they call it legionnaire's disease they were staying there at the hotel it was called the Bellevue Stratford back then. And they were staying there because it was the bicentennial year. So they chose Philadelphia as their the town to gather for their annual convention that year because it was just, you know, footsteps from the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall. So, um, you know, now the Bellevue Hotel is a, a, one of the most amazing places to go and have a drink. In Philadelphia, you can sit high up on top um, and look out with wraparound views of the whole city. It's really magnificent. And that wraps things in well because you talked about hoteliers and figures in fashion and what type of drinks would be served there. And these people probably would have frequented those places. So it all kind of ties in together. And if people want to see the recipe for this specifically, they can check out the show notes of this episode where they can look at this and all of the other recipe spotlights that appear at the end of each episode. So in the next one, we're going to be tackling probably one of the most iconic parts of the Titanic and probably one of the symbols of the spirit of the Titanic. And that is the band, the musicians who were there. And we're going to look at whether they really played on in the way that we think that they did. See you there. So that is the episode for today. As always, I want to thank the Knowlton's Rangers, especially our spy masters, Baron Fraser, Chris from Maine, Carl from Norway, Moondoggy from Ohio, Rick Knowlton, Vic and Irene, Mike from New York, Michelle, and Marlene. I'll explain what that is in a second. 
If you like the show and want to help it grow, there are four easy ways for you to do it. One, like and subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice. This helps spread the word about the show. Two, join our Facebook group. Here we can keep the discussion going about new episodes and you can talk about what you like and didn't like. And you can find this group if you just search for History Unplugged on 